everyone welcome to this session on x-ray in pediatrics i hope you guys are able to see me and hear me well um please leave a thumbs up in the chat box if the streaming is okay okay yes i can see that the streaming is absolutely okay so we will be discussing x-rays in pediatrics today here we are going to discuss at least 50 important x-rays that are asked in every exam okay so don't be worried if you guys feel that i don't know radiology i don't know how to uh, answer clinical based questions we are going to do all of the x-rays that they will be asked in pediatrics today in this session so welcome to the session my name is dr janvi i am the anesthesia educator on unacademy uh, unacademy is india's largest learning app and here on the plus subscription you can get daily live classes live structured courses live tests and quizzes and unlimited access using a single subscription we also have the iconic subscription this subscription will give you the best of unacademy in the form of live classes and batch courses and the best of prep ladder in the form of video lectures and question bank there is a limited time offer that we have going on currently for the neat pg iconic subscription that is of unacademy plus prep ladder you guys can see that a three year subscription will you can get it at 58500 only when the earlier price was 92000 the 24 month subscription or two year subscription you can get it at 49500 only and if you want to buy a yearly subscription you can get it at 40500 we also have a scholarship test that is going on right now so it's called the med minds scholarship test and in this test whoever tops the first rank will get a one year free plus subscription on unacademy and we have prizes for the top 20 ranks as you guys can see we have all these offers going on for whoever wants to buy the plus subscription so you can get a one month free subscription if you buy a three month subscription if you buy the 12 month subscription you get two months free and we also have introduced a four year subscription this four year subscription is for those who have just joined medicine we know the covert situation colleges are sometimes open sometimes shut so you can sit in the comfort and safety of your home and learn subjects from first year second year third year fourth year that is final mbbs so you can finish off all four year subjects through courses that we have dedicated for particular professional years okay in our live classes we have introduced this raise a hand option in which you can speak to the educator while the class is going on yes so we are technologically super smart and we've got this feature so that you all can actually converse with the educator through your laptop and these are all the batches that are now on in plus so we have the integrated clinical batch which has started from 30th of june we'll be having two educators taking classes together like radio pathology dermat pathology uh, so all of those integrated questions that you guys feel that are going to come for next then we also have a high yield revision batch which has just started for the neat pg uh, exam goers of this year so all the subjects all the important topics from them will be revised quickly in this batch we have a neat pg seasons batch for the next year the target next 2022 batch for next year and the focus fmg batch for december fmg so if you buy a simple plus subscription you can attend any of these plus batches any of the plus lectures okay so any and all of them through a single plus subscription okay we have a bugs bounty program if you guys find any faults uh, technical or non-technical in the youtube videos and you report them you will get some prizes and if you guys want to buy the plus subscription which i highly highly recommend for all of you guys at least just try a three month subscription and see okay a three month subscription you'll buy you'll get one month free along with it and that is hardly for eleven thousand rupees and on top of that you can use my code dr janvi life and get extra 10 percent off on that subscription okay so you're hardly going to spend ten thousand rupees for almost four months of subscription which is way cheaper as compared to any of the other classes and you yourself will see how useful the plus subscription is for you guys to help in your preparation okay so let's begin with our first x-ray for today so this is the x-ray i've marked with the arrows and i want you guys to tell me this is a pediatric x-ray of a newborn so what do you think is wrong with this newborn 
what do you guys think is wrong with the newborn anyone can you identify why is there an arrow here in these interlobar fissures exactly and you can see that there is something in these interlobar fissures any idea you can write in the chat box below and i will help you answer this okay so k kashan sankirt all right so this is nothing but fluid in the interlobar fissures okay so if i show you over here if i remove the marking that was there so there is fluid as a result of this these interlobar fissures have become thickened okay so this is a condition called as transient tachypnea of newborn so in transient tachypnea of newborn what is the x ray finding that you get okay so the x ray finding will show you bulging interlobar fissures and why are these interlobar fissures bulging because they are filled with fluid okay now let's see a little bit about transient tachypnea of newborn so what is the age group in which this happens of course if you are talking about newborn then we know that the child is just born but here you have to look at the profile of the child is it a preterm child is it a term child or is it a post term child okay so ttn happens mostly in the term child okay so someone who has completed 38 weeks of gestation now why does it happen in a term child so let's look at the pathology of transient tachypnea of newborn so now usually when there is a vaginal delivery what happens during the vaginal delivery the baby he squeezed out of the vagina okay vagina is such a small place and the big baby almost 2.5 to 3 kg will squeeze himself out of the vagina so during this squeezing process the lungs get completely squished inside okay so when the lungs get squished all that fluid that was collected in the lungs of the baby that will get squeezed out okay so the alveoli will finally be empty and the alveoli can then fill up with air so all the fluid in the alveoli it gets squeezed out when the baby is coming out of the vagina okay so i am writing it over here for you guys so that you all remember it later so during vaginal delivery the lungs get squeezed out and the fluid from alveoli is removed now if you take into consideration a child who is born by lower segment cesarean section then what will happen in this child okay so a child who is born by lower segment cesarean section obviously he will just be removed after the cut is taken on the uterus okay the incision is taken on the uterus and the child is removed there is no squeezing of the lungs as a result of this what happens if this is the alveoli of the uh, child all this fluid remains in it okay so as a result of all the fluid the lungs become heavy there is no space for the air oxygen to enter inside and as a result of this the child becomes hypoxemic okay so you have to apply some pressure to remove all this fluid out of the alveoli of the child now how will this child present to us okay so the presentation of this child will basically be respiratory rate of more than 60 per minute that is the classical presentation and the definition of tachypnea in newborn okay when we are talking about tachypnea increased respiratory rate in newborn that means the rate is more than 60 per minute the child will also have nasal flaring and grunting okay so basically all of these try to tell you these are facial features telling you that the child is finding it difficult to breathe and why is he finding it difficult to breathe because his alveoli is full of fluid now what is the treatment for this how do you remove all this fluid from the alveoli so it is simple you need to apply some kind of pressure in the alveoli so that the fluid is removed and space is made for the air and oxygen so how do you treat this child you give cpap 
okay that is continuous positive airway pressure so just put a mask on the child take an ambu bag and give positive pressure ventilation so that positive pressure ventilation will move all the fluid out of the alveoli okay so the alveoli will become empty and space will be made for oxygen to enter inside okay now in your exam they can ask you what is this appearance of the x-ray of the child so appearance of the x-ray of this child is called a sunburst appearance okay why so okay, you can see these are all these bulging fissures over here correct so this looks like this is the sun is coming up so the heart looks like the sun is coming up and then you have these as the rays of the sun okay so this is called as sun burst appearance all right so this is how you identify an x-ray of transient tachypnea of newborn it's difficult if you if it does not come into your mind during the exam but now that you have seen the x-ray you guys will be able to identify it all right now this is our next x-ray many of you get confused in this x-ray between two differential diagnosis so look at the x-ray and tell me what do you think is the answer anyone what do you think is the answer a and b both give us the same diagnosis very good tina absolutely correct so this is nothing but necrotizing enterocolitis necrotizing enterocolitis okay now many of you get confused that this is congenital diaphragmatic hernia what is the basic difference between nec and congenital diaphragmatic hernia it is super simple there is no rocket science in it if you look in nec whatever air fluid levels you are seeing all these air fluid levels are below the level of the diaphragm okay it's happening in the level below the diaphragm that is in the abdominal cavity because it is enterocolitis the intestines are getting affected in this on the other hand when you have an x-ray of cdh or congenital diaphragmatic hernia in that case this diaphragmatic line will not be seen because it will be breached and you will have bowel entering up into the thoracic cavity okay so this is the main difference between necrotizing enterocolitis and cdh so in cdh the air fluid levels will be seen in the thorax and in necrotizing enterocolitis your air fluid levels will be seen in the abdominal cavity so please remember that it's very important for the exam okay now necrotizing enterocolitis may they will ask you a few things what exactly is necrotizing enterocolitis i'll tell you simply if this is the wall of the intestine of the baby basically this wall will undergo necrosis okay so it will break down and as a result of this whatever are the intestinal bacteria will enter into the peritoneum from here it can also enter into the open blood vessels okay so this bacteria will then spread everywhere and lead to a condition of sepsis because of which the newborn is going to die now in your exam what do they ask you so in your exam first thing that they'll ask you or give, they'll give you a clinical case scenario how to identify this child okay so there are certain features or certain things that predispose a child to necrotizing enterocolitis so what is it in the clinical features try to see whether they say that the child is preterm okay a preterm child basically has an immature gut okay so they it, she, he has an immature immature gi system as a result of this breakdown of this gi system is very easy now next thing if there was any kind of birth asphyxia okay so if you do not provide oxygen if there is any kind of hypoxia in this child it is very easy for the wall to break down why because the wall will not receive oxygen the gut wall will not receive any oxygen and as a result of it it will be become blackened gangrenous necrosis and it will break down okay next and the last thing is a child who is receiving top feed stop feeds means he is not receiving breast milk now in a child who is receiving top feeds there is very high chances of introducing bacteria from outside so if you are giving formula milk whatever kind of vessels you are giving it whatever uh, 
uh, wherever you have kept the milk okay so it can get easily contaminated and all those extra contaminants can go directly into the gut of the child so any child who is receiving top feeds so these are the main criteria for necrotizing enterocolitis okay so all these three clinical features and any one of them or all three of them can come in the exam now how does this child present as so the child presents with clinical features of bloating abdominal distension obviously the child cannot tell you abdominal pain it's a newborn so they will just keep crying and blood in the stools all right so these this is the typical presentation of a child of nec now what is the next question that they ask about nec they ask that is there any staging of nec so yes there is a staging called as bell staging bell staging type 1 2 and 3 one says that you can suspect nec so if he is coming with bloating abdominal distension blood in the stools it can be bell's stage 1 bell stage 2 means there is definitive nec okay for sure there is nec you will see this kind of an x ray in the child so it can prove that there is nec and stage 3 means means it is advanced nec the child has already gone into complications like sepsis and pneumoperitoneum okay two important things that they ask or rather two important terms that they ask in the exam if there is air in the wall of the intestine what do you call this so if in the wall of the intestine over here you find air okay this is called as pneumatosis intestinalis okay and second thing is what if there is air in the portal vein so air in the portal vein because i told you these bacteria can then enter into the blood vessel so that is called as pneumatosis portalis okay pneumatosis portalis all right now let's move on to our next question okay how do you manage this so management medically you can give antibiotics you can keep them nil per oral you will not give them any food to eat in fact or any milk to have sorry because it's a newborn you will just manage on iv fluids containing dextrose okay and surgically you can do a laparotomy you can open up and you can resect the necrose part all right now next x ray can anyone identify this x ray for me so again i'm telling you this is a newborn i'll give you a clinical case scenario newborn coming to us with respiratory rate of more than 60 and having nasal flaring and grunting and low saturation anyone any idea what this could be okay can anyone identify this x ray for me all right how does this x ray look yes very good tina absolutely correct so you can see this is a white out of the lungs can you see the lungs over here i cannot see the lungs so this entire part of both the areas of the lungs is looking completely white correct so there is white out of the lung or in other words you can also call it as ground glassing of the lungs okay so ground glassing of the lungs or white out of the lungs both of these are seen in a condition called as hyaline membrane disease the other name for hyaline membrane disease anyone what is the other name the other name for hyaline membrane disease is respiratory distress of newborn now this hyaline membrane disease or respiratory distress of newborn is most commonly seen in which babies okay now this is important because in your clinical case scenario they'll ask you is this in a term baby preterm baby post term baby what okay so remember this is seen in preterm babies okay those who are born before the entire gestational period is over now why does this happen what is the pathology in this case so hyaline membrane disease is basically formed is caused because there is a deficiency of surfactant okay now you all know what is the role of surfactant surfactant will allow easy closing and opening of the alveoli correct now if the child is born preterm or premature there is not enough time for production of surfactant 
as a result of this the alveoli when they close they don't open up easily okay so because of this surfactant deficiency the alveoli collapse and they don't open up easily so if they collapse the child is unable to breathe so main majority of the alveoli will be all collapsed and as a result of this the child will find it difficult to breathe okay so the child will come with clinical features of respiratory rate more than 60 that is tachypnea grunting nasal flaring and cyanosis okay so this is what happens in highline membrane disease of newborn okay now another question that they ask you in the exam is what is the score that is used for classifying the severity of respiratory distress in this case okay so there is a score i will write the name of the score over here it is called as silverman score silverman score it is used for calculating the severity of respiratory distress in a child of highline membrane disease now what is the treatment of this condition of course it's very easy deficiency is of surfactant so what will you do you will give surfactant to the child so if the alveoli are collapsed first of all you have to open up the alveoli okay so to open up the alveoli you will first give positive airway pressure okay so you will give positive airway pressure cpap to open up the alveoli now to keep the alveoli open you need to give surfactant because you know there is surfactant deficiency so you can give surfactant to the child through the endotracheal tube okay you can give surfactant through the endotracheal tube okay now what is the ways of giving surfactant okay so the ways of giving surfactant there are three ways i will just write it is called as one is called as mist another is called as lisa and the third is called as in short so does anyone know what is the full form of these this is giving surfactant to the child okay so mist is minimally invasive surfactant therapy you need to know all these full forms they will ask you in the exam okay lisa is less invasive surfactant administration okay and insure insure in is for intubate then s is for give surfactant and e is extubate okay so intubate the child give surfactant and extubate the child okay so all of these are given to the child once the child is born and he is having highline membrane disease but what if you want to prevent if you want to prevent highline membrane disease so prophylactically what can you give to the mother now you may have a mother whom you know is going to deliver prematurely and you want the lungs of the baby to produce some surfactant when the baby is born okay so what can you do in that case we can give steroids now all of us know the answer to this so there are two types of steroids you can give you can give dexamethasone this is given 6 mg into four doses of dexamethasone okay and the second is you can give beta methasone so this is given as 12 mg into two doses of beta methasone 24 hours apart okay so these are given for prevention of highline membrane disease but if the child is already born with highline membrane disease in that case you have to give him surfactant from outside by any of these three methods mist lisa or insure okay Ro definitely you should know the full form of all of them okay next picture over here i have marked with an arrow try to identify what i am showing over here so anything specific about these pictures these metacarpals can you call them something i am showing you the metacarpals over here and the second thing i want you guys to see is also these vertebra so again there is an arrow over here you will see that they are narrowing like this so can you guys try to identify what disease is this and what are we talking about anyone can you identify for me
ओके आई एम वेटिंग अब्दुल मेनिया टीना यस आशीष वेरी गुड यस सो दीज मेटा कपल्स आर शेप इन द फॉर्म ऑफ बुलेट ओके सो दीज आर कॉल्ड एज बुलेट शेप्ड मेटा कपल्स ओके एंड एनी वन अबाउट द वर्टिब्रा वॉट इज इट अबाउट द वर्टिब्रा कैन एनी वन टेल मी वॉट इज हैपनिंग टू द वर्टिब्रा एट द टिप इट्स बिकमिंग वेरी नैरो ओके सो दीज नैरोड वर्टिब्रा आर कॉल्ड एज और दिस इज कॉल्ड एज बीकिंग ऑफ वर्टिब्रे ओके सो दिस ओवर यूर इज बुलेट शेप मेटा कपल्स एंड दिस इज बीकिंग ऑफ वर्टिब्रे एंड एज यू गाइज हैव मैंशन इट करेक्टली एस टीना हैज मैंशन इट करेक्टली बोथ ऑफ दीज आर सीन इन म्यूको पॉलीसैक्राइडोसिस ओके म्यूको पॉलीसैक्राइडोसिस ओके नाउ इन म्यूको पॉलीसैक्राइडोसिस इफ दे आस्क यू इन द एग्जाम वॉट आर द इम्पॉर्टेंट क्लिनिकल फीचर्स सो देर इज वन आई टेल यू देर इज अ ब्रॉड फोर हेड ऑफ द चाइल्ड ही विल हैव अ फ्लैट नेजल ब्रिज एंड वन वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट थिंग दैट यू विल सी इज यू विल सी क्लाउडिंग ऑफ द कॉर्निया ओके सो देर विल बी ब्रॉड फोर हेड फ्लैट नेजल ब्रिज एंड क्लाउडी कॉर्निया दिस इज सुपर इंपॉर्टेंट वेन वी आर टॉकिंग अबाउट म्यूको पॉलीसैक्राइडोसिस एंड अलॉन्ग विद दैट इफ दे गिव यू इन द एक्सरेज दिस बीकिंग ऑफ वर्टिब्रा और बुलेट शेप मेटा कपल्स योर एग्जाम योर प्रॉब्लम इज सॉल्व यू नो दैट दिस इज म्यूको पॉलीसैक्राइडोसिस ओके सो क्विकली जस्ट टेलिंग यू द नेम्स ऑफ द डिफरेंट म्यूको पॉलीसैक्राइडोसिस डिजीज वन टू थ्री फोर वी डोंट हैव अ सिक्स सो सॉरी वी डोंट हैव अ फाइव सो सिक्स एंड सेवन ओके दीज आर ऑल योर म्यूकोपॉलीसैक्राइडोसिस टाइप वन इज कॉल्ड एज हर्लर शेई डिजीज टाइप टू इज कॉल्ड एज हंटर्स डिजीज टाइप थ्री इज कॉल्ड एज सैन फिलिपो डिजीज टाइप फोर इज कॉल्ड एज मॉर्क्यू डिजीज टाइप सिक्स इज कॉल्ड एज मॉर्थ्यूलामी डिजीज एंड टाइप सेवन इज कॉल्ड एज स्लाई डिजीज ओके so these are all your different types of muco polysaccharidosis how will you identify the child will come with broad forehead cloudy cornea flat nasal bridge beaking of vertebra on x ray and bullet shape metacarpals okay all right now let's move on to our next picture so here i'm showing you two ct scans look at this ct scan in a child and this ct scan in a child okay so what is are these i'm telling you it is uh, an infection in the brain of the child you need to identify in a what is the infection and in b what is the infection and how do you differentiate between the two come on i want you guys to answer okay can anyone identify calcification very good tina but where exactly is this calcification now this is the ventricle of the brain and these calcifications you can see is around the ventricle of the brain correct so see where i'm marking in yellow this this is called as periventricular calcification so i'll write it over here for you guys periventricular calcification so can anyone identify in which disease yes very good ashish and tina so periventricular calcification is seen in cmv okay cmv and this is diffuse calcification can you see here the calcification is all over the brain there is no particular area where it is there okay so this calcification is called as diffuse calcification and where is this diffuse calcification seen this is calcification and diffuse calcification one is seen in case of um uh, cmv and the second one is seen in case of toxoplasmosis all right now in your exam they will ask you a few questions about torch infections okay so especially about cmv why because cmv is the most common torch infection that is transferred to the child okay so what is the question that they ask in the exam they ask you mother to child transmission mother to child transmission 
ma maximum risk is in which trimester so in first trimester second trimester or third trimester which trimester will have maximum transmission of the disease from mother to child anyone tell me what do you think any idea okay i will tell you the maximum transmission yes very good tina maximum transmission is in the third trimester why because at the time of delivery there is breach of membranes both of the child as well as of the mother so easily these bacteria uh, sorry these viruses can transfer from the mother to the child open membrane say blood exchange say all of this can be transferred from the mother to the child okay now between cmv and toxoplasmosis they will also ask you how to clinically differentiate not just the ct scan but how is their clinical differentiation so remember in cmv the child will come with low iq and microcephaly and seizures okay so small brain with small iq and seizures on the other hand in case of toxoplasmosis the child will come with a big brain okay not the brain but actually the head is big because there is hydrocephalus often in the child okay so there will be hydrocephalus in the child and of course as we discussed earlier about the calcification from the ct scan here in case of cmv there will be periventricular calcification and in case of toxoplasmosis there will be diffuse calcification all right so clear with this okay now let's move on to our next usg now in this usg i want you guys to identify what is being shown by this arrows in a and in b any idea okay let me give you some context behind this usg this is a usg being done of the stomach in a newborn okay now what are the clinical features of this newborn he is basically presenting with non bilious vomiting whenever he has breast milk he starts vomiting and he is very lethargic any idea what could this be and what exactly is being shown in the pictures yes very good vikran tina ashish yes so this is nothing but infantile hypertrophic pyloric stenosis okay so chpss ihpss whatever you want to call it it is that okay now here what are they showing you here through this arrow they are showing you the thickness of the pyloric muscle so what happens over here is basically this is your stomach uh, i don't have space to draw it otherwise yeah, i'll draw it over here okay so if this is your stomach over here body of the stomach and here this is your pylorus this muscle becomes very thick as a result of this this pyloric canal becomes very narrow okay so in this over here they are showing you the thickness of the pyloric muscle this part the thickness of the pyloric muscle okay so the thickness of the pyloric muscle over here if you see on usg of more than 4 mm okay or if the canal length this canal length is more than 16 mm they are they are showing you the canal length so if the canal length is more than 16 mm or if the thickness of the pylorus muscle is more than 4 mm that means you can definitely say that the child has infantile hypertrophic pyloric stenosis okay now questions that they ask about infantile hypertrophic pyloric stenosis so the first question that they will ask you is what drug is associated with ihps okay so if the mother takes this drug during the first two weeks of pregnancy then the child can have chances of developing ihps is anyone do you know the name of that drug what is the offending drug which causes ihps is okay so the offending drug that causes ihps is is erythromycin okay erythromycin all right now next what are the symptoms that the child will present with i have told you this before i gave you in the case scenario the child will come with non bilious vomiting okay now why non bilious vomiting so see this is your stomach okay and this is the part of the pylorus which is completely become very thickened and the pyloric canal 
and now this your duodenum is starting from here now where does your bile come your bile comes from your liver it goes into the second part of the duodenum remember in d2 because in the through the ampulla of waiter now if your bile is reaching in d2 obviously the food that you are taking the breast milk that the child is taking is getting stuck over here and by vomiting it's going from your up okay so there is no place for bile to mix over here the bile is coming way below it over here as a result of this whatever the child is eating he is vomiting out but this whatever he has eaten is not mixing with bile okay so as a result of this there is non bilious vomiting in this case the breast milk or the food is not reaching down even till the duodenum second part of duodenum to mix with bile okay so the second thing that the child will come if you feel if you palpate the area of the stomach you will feel an olive shaped mass over there what is this olive shaped mass it is nothing but this hypertrophied muscle of the pylorus okay so olive shaped mass on palpation and because the muscles are so hypertrophied you will be able to see the peristalsis of the muscles okay so you will see visible peristalsis of the stomach so these are the features that the child will come with in case of infantile hypertrophic pyloric stenosis okay now second or uh, important question about ihpss is they will ask you what is the ph what is the ph okay so the ph in the body so remember i told you now again here you have your stomach hmm? this is the hypertrophied pylorus now whatever the child is having he is going to vomit it out along with the food he will also vomit out all the acid that the stomach produces okay so if he is going to vomit out the hydrochloric acid you are losing out on the chlorine correct so as a result of this you will have hypochloremic okay now second thing is he is going he is throwing out acid so acid is being thrown out so as a result of this what will be the ph of the body there will be hypochloremic metabolic alkalosis all right now along with this hypochloremic metabolic alkalosis that is produced in the body so why alkalosis because acid that is produced in the gastric in the stomach is being thrown out second thing why hypochloremic because the acid that is produces hydrochloric acid so chlorine is being lost okay now what is happening in this case is along with loss of hcl you are also losing sodium okay sodium is also being thrown out of the body so there is hyponatremia in case of this child okay so in order so because of this hyponatremia the child is very lethargic now in order to save the sodium what does the body do the body will try to throw out potassium and hydrogen okay this you know that the renal compensation is basically the kidneys will throw out potassium and hydrogen and try to save this sodium okay now when you throw out potassium and hydrogen what will happen this hydrogen is nothing but acid so you throw it out in the urine so you are getting acid urea okay acid urea why acid urea acid urea simply means you are throwing out h plus ions in the urine okay now why is this called as paradoxical acid urea now see in your body you have alkalosis so ideally you should be keeping the acids in the body so that you can maintain the body ph but here what are you doing you are throwing out the acid in the urine correct so that is why it is called as paradoxical acid urea so this is something a uh, important concept that you need to remember about ihpss there will be hypochloremic metabolic alkalosis along with paradoxical acid urea is very very important question comes in almost every exam and they twist and turn and keep asking you again and again but once you understand the concept you will never forget it okay now second thing that they will ask you is what is the treatment of ihpss so all of us know what is the surgery for ihpss it is called as ramstedt's pyloromyotomy what are you going to do in this case basically split up this muscle over here make it thinner so that the canal will open up easily okay all right now these are a few other ultrasound signs that you see in case of ihpss so you can see this thickened muscle and its mucosa make it look ekdam like a track of the railway okay so this is also called as double track sign 
and then you also have another sign which is called as target sign that is seen in this case okay all right now next x-ray identify this x-ray चलो जल्दी बताओ एवरी वन हुज कम फॉर क्लास वी ऑल्सो हैव अ क्लास एट एट थर्टी पी एम ऑन द लेटेस्ट गाइडलाइंस ऑफ सी पी आर सो आई हैव मेड लाइक थर्टी क्वेश्चन ऑन द लेटेस्ट सी पी आर गाइडलाइंस ओके सो मेक श्योर टू अटेंड दैट ऑन यूट्यूब ओनली आई एल पोस्ट द लिंक फॉर दैट ऑन माई टेलीग्राम ग्रुप सो यू गाइज कैन सी इट ओवर देर I hope you guys are all there on Telegram group. Yes. So, what is the name of this sign? You can see one bubble over here, and the second bubble you can see over here. These are all air bubbles, huh? Bubble. You all must be wondering what bubble. Okay. So, one bubble, one air bubble here, one air bubble here. So, this is called as double bubble sign. Double bubble sign, and this is seen in duodenal atresia. Okay. Duodenal atresia. clear okay now tell me about duodenal atresia what is the most common syndrome associated with it what is the most common genetic syndrome associated with duodenal atresia yes sir absolutely correct this is double bubble sign seen in duodenal atresia one bubble will be of the gastric bubble okay the air in the stomach and the second bubble will be the air in the duodenum okay now tell me what is the most common syndrome associated very good navjats so the answer for this is down syndrome so if you see in 30% of the patients of down syndrome you will have duodenal atresia okay now next question for you guys what is the type of vomiting in duodenal atresia now tell me what is the type of vomiting is it bilious vomiting or is it non bilious vomiting and what is the treatment also wo bhi bata do is this bilious or non bilious vomiting in the previous case in ihpss i told you it is non bilious correct now here what is happening food will go down in through the pylorus into the duodenum it's mixing here bile is coming over here d2 may anyone so yes so whatever food you eat it will pass into the duodenum and it will mix with this bile okay it will mix with this bile over here so if the child vomits then in that case this will be bilious vomiting so here it is mixing with the bile in the second part of the duodenum that is why vomiting in this case will be bilious vomiting okay all right what is the treatment of this treatment of this anyone all right so what you do if this suppose imagine just imagine this is the atretic part of the duodenum so you cut it out and you just join the two normal parts of the duodenum okay so this is the normal part of the duodenum this is the normal part of the duodenum one second ha huh? this is the normal part this is the normal part so you remove the atretic part and join the two normal parts so this in simple words is also called as duodeno duodeno stomy okay duodeno duodeno stomy all right now next x ray for you guys identify this picture and what is this condition so in the x ray over here you can see there are multiple cystic huge cystic spaces and on the ct scan also you can see in the lung on the right side on the in the right lung you can see these multiple cystic spaces batao what is this many of you will get confused over here also and answer it as congenital diaphragmatic hernia but what is the answer in this case very good ashish very good okay so this is nothing but i'll write it over here this is congenital it is in small words it is called as cpam the full form is it's not diaphragmatic hernia okay see 
in diaphragmatic hernia very important for me to explain it to you over here because many of you will make this mistake and then your rank will go down so you can see over here the line of the diaphragm if the line of the diaphragm is maintained in that case this is cpam if the line of the diaphragm is not maintained if it is breached and you have something coming out from the diaphragm up into the thoracic cavity then that is your diaphragmatic hernia okay so please remember that this is not diaphragmatic hernia this is cpam what is cpam cpam is congenital pulmonary airway malformation okay congenital pulmonary airway malformation i don't know if you guys can see what i'm writing down or no but hopefully you are able to see so how will you identify this and how will you differentiate between this and cdh is the line of the diaphragm is maintained in cpam and you will see cystic spaces ahead up above, above in the lung and maybe they can also give you a ct scan in which you can see these cystic spaces okay now next question for you guys anyone can you identify what is this x ray again congenital condition i have also given you the lateral x ray you can see here it is looking little hyper lucent even here on the right lower lobe side it is looking a little hyper lucent as compared to others anyone can you identify it's a congenital condition in which you will get hyper lucency in one of the lobes okay chalo i will only tell you this answer is congenital sorry this is congenital lobar emphysema okay so in any one lobe of the lung if you see hyper lucency and they say it is a congenital lesion then this is congenital lobar emphysema now this can be asked what is the most common lobe in which you see cle so the most common lobe is actually the left upper lobe okay left upper lobe in which you see cle okay next x next x ray identify this so here i am telling you the child is coming with features of pneumonia now looking at a and looking at b i want you to identify the offending organism in this case what is the causative organism or the offending organism in this case a me kya hai offending organism first of all see over here in a what can you see over here see i am marking with green you can see that in the right upper lobe there is some consolidation correct so i'll write over here right upper lobe consolidation so which organism causes consolidation in pneumonia lobar consolidation in pneumonia any idea tina any idea ashish rohan tavish okay so your upper your lobar consolidation is caused by streptococcus pneumonia okay streptococcus pneumonia now on the other hand look at x ray b in x ray b legion ela theek hai if you see over here you can see that there is ground glassing of both the lower lobes okay the right as well as of the left side so here you can see that the pneumonia is affected bilaterally and this is typically seen in atypical pneumonia okay atypical pneumonia so this here the cause can be mycoplasma pneumonia so if both the lungs is affected it is mostly atypical pneumonia here it can be mycoplasma and if you have lobar consolidation then this is streptococcus pneumonia okay all right now let's move on to our next and most favorite x ray asked in fmg exam this year all the fmg aspirants you should definitely know the answer to this very good tina has actually given us the image for this this is the thumb sign absolutely correct nice way of writing it tina okay so can you see over here you can see this thumb thumb over here hmm so this is the thumb sign this is because of inflammation of the epiglottis so what are we looking at this is nothing but acute epiglottitis acute epiglottitis okay and thumb sign theek hai abhi mujhe ye batao now all of us know what are the most common organisms causing acute epiglottitis this that but i want to ask you guys one important question on laryngoscopy suppose i do a laryngoscopy in this patient 
what will i find in this case how will the epiglottis look there is a particular color of the epiglottis can you guys tell me what can i find how will the epiglottis look what color most easy yes tina but in the exam you all get confused in the most easy things also barabar abhi chalo batao what what will you see on epiglottis uh, ep yeah so on laryngoscopy you will find a cherry red epiglottis okay cherry red epiglottis so the epiglottis because it is so edematous it looks absolutely red in color it looks like a cherry red color okay now second thing what are the clinical features of this child it's important because this you all many a times get confused with uh, croup so remember in acute epiglottitis the child will be very very sick looking okay he will look very toxic that's the word and second thing he will have high grade fever and he will present in something called as the tripod position what is tripod position so basically when you put both your uh, hands down so when suppose i tell you run a big marathon okay you run a big marathon and at the end of it you're so tired and you're just wanting to breathe so you start putting your hands down and you breathe aise <sighs> you breathe very heavily correct so that is called as tripod position tripod is basically like this three things down so your legs will be down and your hands will be down okay so that is tripod position and that is seen in case of acute respiratory distress in acute epiglottitis okay what is the treatment in this case very important treatment is by giving the antibiotics all right now let's look at another x ray with which you guys get confused and that's why i wanted to put both of them side by side and discuss this with you all so can anyone identify in this case what is the problem चलो टीना नवजोत परेश आशीष एनी वन दिस इज वेरी इजी गाइस यू नो दैट लाइन दैट इज देयर द द आई कैन नॉट सी व्हाट द माइंड डज नॉट नो सो इफ द माइंड डज नॉट नो व्हाट इज व्हाट टू लुक फॉर द आईज विल आल्सो नॉट बी एबल टू सी ओवर योर एंड इफ आई शो यू यू ऑलवेल से मैम दिस वाज सो इजी ओके ये देखो यहाँ पे एनी does this tell you anything now i will remove this marking and now tell me okay so this is called as steepel sign steepel sign this is seen in which condition guys everyone knows the answer to this come on tell me plethoric lung no no this is steepel sign barabar very good rishi okay so this is steepel sign what is steepel basically when you go to a church have you seen in a church that they have esa the building is like this and on top of it there is a uh, thing and then there is that cross mark okay so this is called as steeple now this steeple sign you can see it over here if i mark it for you you guys will be able to see it this is the steeple sign okay now steeple sign is seen in which condition it is seen in croup क्रूप का दूसरा नाम क्या है इट इज अक्यूट लैरिंगो ट्रिक्यो ब्रोंकाइटिस क्रूप इज नथिंग बट अक्यूट लैरिंगो ट्रिक्यो ब्रोंकाइटिस ओके वॉट इज द मोस्ट कॉमन ऑर्गेनिज्म कॉजिंग क्रूप मोस्ट कॉमन ऑर्गेनिज्म कॉजिंग क्रूप इज अरे यार ठीक है सॉरी मोस्ट कॉमन ऑर्गेनिज्म कॉजिंग क्रूप इज पैरा इन्फ्लुएंजा वायरस बराबर पैरा इन्फ्लुएंजा वायरस ओके नाउ वॉट इज द characteristic clinical feature of croup now how will you identify the characteristic clinical feature there is one word that if you see in the exam you should say are this is 100% croup okay and that is the type of cough that the patient have so if the child has a barking cough okay or if he has a brassy cough in that case this is nothing but croup just close your eyes and go ahead and mark the answer as croup if they give you an x ray and you can see the steeple sign nothing that is like sone pe suhaga but if in the clinical features of the case scenario they give you brassy or barking cough still it is very uh, easy to identify this as croup okay and remember what is the difference between croup and um, 
acute epiglottitis in acute epiglottitis the child looks very sick in this the child is not very sick looking okay so he'll look pretty okay to you he won't be in tripod position and trying to breathe very heavily okay none of that will be there and what is the treatment for croup now croup is a viral infection correct para influenza is a virus so no need of giving antibiotics like in acute epiglottitis so it is just supportive treatment and steroids and just in case that there is a lot of edema in the airway then what you can do is you can give the child adrenaline nebulization okay adrenaline nebulization that will help in reducing the edema by causing vasoconstriction okay or right. now next x-ray identify this x-ray this is also a little difficult x-ray let's see if you guys can identify it Yes, steam inhalation also you can give. Of course, steam will also help in reducing the edema, Sylvester. But uh, it would be if there is very difficult strider, then in that case you can give adrenaline nebulization. Anyone? Can you identify this X-ray? Sorry. Very good, Tina. Very good. So this is coarctation of aorta. Can you see over here three sign? This is your three sign and this is called as coarctation of aorta. Okay. Yes. Very good. Navjad Z Medicos. Good. Good. Okay. I thought you guys will not identify it. I'm removing the. Um, okay. Now it can't be removed. So that is your three signs seen in coarctation of aorta. Now coarctation of aorta may they will ask you a few questions. Which is the most common part of aorta in which you get coarctation. So here my options will be preductal. Ductal or postductal. What is that? Preductal and postductal. Basically, the area where the PDA or patent ductus arteriosus connects from the pulmonary artery to the aorta. So, in which part will you see most commonly the coarctation? In preductal part or postductal part? Okay. So, most commonly your coarctation of aorta is seen in the postductal part. Now, your postductal part supplies blood flow to your lower limbs. So, if there is coarctation, if there is reduced blood flow from the postductal part, there will be decreased blood flow to your lower limbs. So, what will be the clinical features of this condition? If there is reduced blood flow to lower limb, your femoral pulse will be feeble and you will present with intermittent claudication. Okay intermittent claudication because of reduced blood flow to the lower limb you will have pain in the legs intermittently okay so this is your coarctation of aorta now this is something that you can see on barium swallow this is a barium swallow and in this case again it is coarctation of aorta only but what sign are you seeing in this case in this case you are seeing the reverse three sign so see over here this is called as the reverse three sign okay this is seen in coarctation of aorta all right so when you are seeing in the x-ray you will see three sign but in the barium swallow what will you see in the barium swallow you will see reverse three sign okay all right now next x-ray anyone can you identify this for me Okay, what is this? Alright, so here you can see that the bladder is seen very well and it is distended. This is the part of the prostatic urethra that you can see is very distended and then this is your part of the rest of the urethra, penile urethra and everything. Okay, membranous and penile urethra. So you can see your uh, prostatic urethra and bladder is very distended over here. So what is the problem? 
this first of all is what kind of study this is your micturating cystourethrogram okay so one important thing that you need to know is the difference between micturating cystourethrogram and retrograde urethrogram okay now micturating cystourethrogram name say you should know that this is done when you are micturating or when you are passing urine okay so this may you will be able to see the bladder very well and the entire part of the urethra very well as the uh urine flows from bladder to urethra okay on the other hand in retrograde urethrogram what you do is you put the tip of the foley's in the urethra and you give contrast so you can see only the urethra very well you will not be able to see the bladder very well so how to identify the difference between mcu and rgu mcu may bladder will be seen very well and rgu may urethra will be seen very well bladder will not be seen very well okay now here you can see over here the bladder and prostatic urethra is dilated so what is the problem over here we are having some kind of compression so this is nothing but posterior urethral valve there is posterior urethral valve okay now clinical features of this how will the child present because of collection of the urine because of stasis of the urine the child will come with recurrent urinary tract infection and also there will be dribbling of urine continuously okay dribbling of urine and recurrent uti but most commonly there will be recurrent uti now how do you treat this by surgery you will fulgurate the valves so fulguration of valves or breaking of the valves so once you break the valves the urine can flow out uh, easily and all that uh, urine that is collect getting collected back here will now be able to pass easily okay so you will relieve the obstruction okay now easy x ray i know we have seen a lot of difficult x rays good evening ritwik join the class now easy x ray for you guys to identify ye to 1 minute mein aa jana chahiye chalo very good navjit yes this is nothing but your boot shaped heart you can't take so much time to identify guys this is the easiest x ray in pediatrics that i can ask you this is your boot shaped heart and it is typically seen in tetralogy of fallot now of course if i'm giving you an easy x ray my question won't be easy to you so i want you guys to tell me in these three shunts which vessel is connected to which vessel okay you know that tof ke bare mein everyone knows everything but there is one thing that people forget that is the shunts that are used for treatment of tof okay so we have three shunts first is bt shunt or blaloctosic shunt this is the most commonly used one next we have waterson shunt and third we have potts shunt so i want you guys to tell me in these shunts you are connecting some artery to the pulmonary artery correct so which artery is connected to what in pulmonary artery sorry in each of these shunts drop pneumonic okay so drop pneumonic nahi hai uh, acha i will give you one easier way to remember this okay now blaloctosic shunt mein to tumko yaad rakhna padega because this is the most commonly done shunt so here your subclavian artery is connected to your pulmonary artery now in waterson shunt and pot shunt it is very easy to identify imagine you are keeping a pot down and you are pouring water from above okay so pot is down pot is down so pot is down or descending aorta okay and water is coming from above so water is ascending aorta okay so this is how you remember which part or which vessel is connected to the pulmonary artery so in bt shunt you have subclavian artery connected to pulmonary artery and in waterson shunt as water is coming from above you connect the ascending aorta and as pot is kept below you connect the descending aorta okay clear okay next one identify this x ray शांत से याद रखो हाँ स्पेशली आई एन आई सी ई टी के लिए दे विल नॉट आस्क यू स्ट्रेट फॉरवर्ड क्वेश्चन दे विल वॉन्ट सम डिफिकल्ट क्वेश्चन वॉट इज दिस कंडीशन 
very easy to identify i guess there is a little bit of a lag in the comments that's why it's not coming pericardial effusion no but good guess box shaped heart very good tina so box shaped heart is seen in which condition per sign very good tina okay box shaped heart yes it is seen in epstein's anomaly epstein's anomaly okay now epstein's anomaly ke bare mein what is the question that they will ask you so first question is what is the drug associated with antenatal exposure which can lead to epstein's anomaly anyone very good tina so it is lithium if you if the mother is exposed to lithium if she is taking antidepressants antipsychotics which contain lithium then the child can end up having epstein's anomaly of the heart okay second question that they will ask you what is the most common arrhythmias that you see in epstein anomaly and third question that they will ask you is epstein's anomaly is associated with which syndrome of the heart on ecg what can you find लिथियम बराबर है सब सब लोग अभी ये बताओ मोस्ट कॉमन एरिथमियाज ओके सो द मोस्ट कॉमन एरिथमियाज दैट यू सी इन एपस्टीन जनोमली इज पी एस वी टी और पैरोक्सिसमेल सुपरा वेंट्रिकुलर टैकीकार्डिया एंड वॉट सिंड्रोम इज इट एसोसिएटेड विद और वॉट इज योर ई सी जी फाइंडिंग सो यू विल ऑफन फाइंड डब्ल्यू पी डब्ल्यू सिंड्रोम ऑन ई सी जी ओके सो यू विल फाइंड डेल्टा वेव्स एंड दैट इज नथिंग बट योर डब्ल्यू पी डब्ल्यू सिंड्रोम ओके डेल्टा वेव्स ऑन ई और डब्ल्यू पी डब्ल्यू सिंड्रोम ओके चलो नेक्स्ट एक्सरे ये एक्सरे में बताओ एनी पर्टिकुलर अपियरेंस ऑफ द हार्ट that you guys can identify yes very good <clears throat> this is egg on a string appearance perfect egg on a string appearance seen in which condition either tina is too smart or her wifi is too fast that's why all of tina's answers are coming first okay so this this looks like an egg on a string appearance of the heart and this is seen in transposition of great arteries correct now transposition of great arteries kis mein puchhenge so what are the questions that they ask now simply i want to ask you what is the treatment of this what is the name of the procedures that you do for this okay so in transposition of great arteries your aorta is coming out from the right ventricle and your pulmonary art is coming out from the pulmonary artery is coming out from the left ventricle so what can you do you can do an arterial switch arterial switch procedure does anyone know the name of this procedure this is called as <clears throat> jatin's procedure okay jatin's procedure second thing that you can do is instead of switching the uh, pulmonary artery and aorta you can simply just create a hole in the atrium okay so your aorta is coming out from here from the right side and your pulmonary artery is coming out from here जो उल्टा हो रहा है करेक्ट सो वॉट यू वॉट डू यू वॉन्ट ओवर योर यू वॉन्ट दैट देर शुड बी मिक्सिंग ऑफ ब्लड सो टू मिक्स द ब्लड यू कैन जस्ट क्रिएट अ होल ओवर योर इन द एट्रिया एंड यू कैन अलाउ द मिक्सिंग ऑफ ब्लड सो दिस इज कॉल्ड एज एट्रियल सेप्टोस्टोमी एंड वॉट इज द नेम ऑफ दिस प्रोसीजर दिस इज कॉल्ड एज रैश काइंड प्रोसीजर okay this is called as rash kind procedure all right next question for you guys identify this x ray anyone what is this called yes very good this is called as snowman appearance so this looks like a snowman does it ye snowman ki topi idhar and if you draw over here 
this looks like a snowman okay so this is called as snowman appearance and this is also called as figure of eight appearance of the heart and both of these whatever this appearance is seen in total anomalous pulmonary venous connection okay all right next one over here what is this on ct scan if you see this enlarged this enlargement that you can see over here what is it called any idea it is filled with contrast the contrast has gone into that vessel <laughs> carrot what carrot is this okay so this is i don't know if you guys will be able to identify it but this is called as vein of gallen malformation okay so what is vein of gallen you just need to know very less of vein of gallen but i exam may identify karna aana chahiye if they ask you okay so vein of gallen is nothing but an arteriovenous fistula in the brain theek hai to vein of gallen mein kya hota hai na your you have two arteries you have the anterior cerebral artery and the anterior choroidal artery of the brain and both of them actually empty into a vein now what is this vein that it is emptying into this is called as median prosencephalic vein this is called as median prosencephalic vein okay so your aca anterior cerebral and anterior choroidal artery are connecting with this vein median prosencephalic vein and as a result of this you can see this is your median prosencephalic vein that is completely dilated because it is being filled by the arterial blood okay so this is nothing but an av malformation and what do they ask in the exam they ask you what is the cause of death in vein vein of gallen malformation so the cause of death in this case is congestive cardiac failure now why should there be congestive cardiac failure over here so your you have an arteriovenous fistula so the blood is circulating from the arterial system to the venous system only it's staying within the circulation so this is a type of high output circulation or sorry this is a type of hyperdynamic circulation okay so this leads to a high output cardiac failure since there is so much blood in the circulation the heart has to work extra hard it has to put in more energy and sometimes the there can be a demand supply mismatch it will not get enough oxygen to pump out so much blood from the heart and there will be ischemia and the patient can die okay so that is your vein of gallen malformation okay now next over here can you identify anything over here you can see there is a collection of csf in this case and you are not able to see the cerebellar vomis any idea what is this so there is cerebellar vomis a genesis in this case plus you can see that the fourth ventricle here is dilated now why will the fourth ventricle get dilated of course if there is some obstruction ahead okay if there is some obstruction ahead as a result of it csf cannot flow into the spinal cavity because of that there will be collection of csf and enlargement of the fourth ventricle so you can see over here that what is the, what are the ventricles ahead the ventricles are foramen of lushaka and foramen of majendi those are the two places where the csf will flow into so if there is any kind of obstruction over there all the csf will get collected and it will enlarge the fourth ventricle so fourth ventricle dilatation plus cerebellar vomis agenesis both of these are seen in dandy walker malformation okay dandy walker malformation chalo now next x ray what can you see in this particular lesion seen in a disease very easy to identify if i give you this kind of appearance of the skull what is this appearance of the skull called called as you can see you have these little 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 lesions what is this appearance of the skull called as anyone is this called as punched out lesions of the skull correct lytic lesions in the skull or punched out lesions of the skull 
yes very good z medico so one of the reasons why you will have these punched out lesions of the skull is because of langerhans cell histiocytosis okay now can anyone identify what i am showing you in the picture of electron microscopy below idhar niche kya dikh raha hai aise racket jaise jo dikh raha hai tennis racket jaise dikh raha hai actually it could be badminton racket also but the name is tennis racket <laughs> okay so this is nothing but burbex granules burbex granules they are tennis racket shaped granules that you will find in rangahan cell histiocytosis okay now let me ask you what is the name of this disease this triad is seen in which disease so if you have a bone defect calvarial bone defect you have diabetes insipidus and you have exophthalmos so this is seen in which disease what is the name of this disease the one which shows you calvarial bone defect diabetes insipidus and exophthalmos anyone any idea okay so you find this in a disease called as hand schuller christian disease hand schuller christian disease okay all right now let's move on to our next ct scan now from the brain and little bit of the head next scans let's move towards the abdomen so can you guys see anything over here this is one side ka kidney which is normal anything else that you can see which does not seem right to you if you guys can identify it ओके सो कैन यू गाइस सी ओवर योर दिस साइड का किडनी तो दिखा ही नहीं दे रहा बराबर से ओके इट्स नॉट सीन प्रॉपरली बट डेफिनेटली यू कैन सी सम कैल्सिफिकेशन इनसाइड इट डेफिनेटली देर इज अ मास हियर व्हिच इज अंडरगोइंग कैल्सिफिकेशन सो यू कैन सी अ मास इन द किडनी अलोंग विद कैल्सिफिकेशन सो कैन एनीवन आइडेंटिफाई फॉर मी व्हाट इज दिस दैट वी आर सीइंग टीना आशीष गायत्री संतोष मिता so this side ka kidney looks normal this side there is some mass that you can see in the kidney and plus it is showing calcification inside very commonly seen in children okay so this is nothing but yes very good ashish so this is nothing but neuroblastoma of the kidney okay neuroblastoma of the kidney all right what is the most common site of neuroblastoma anyone if i am talking about neuroblastoma in the body what is the most common site first most common site and second most common site okay first most common site is in suprarenal area so it can be a suprarenal mass you can see over here also you cannot identify it between the kidney and the suprarenal area over here but this is a suprarenal mass okay and second most common area that you can see a neuroblastoma is paravertebral sympathetic ganglia all right now you guys tell me what is this yes so the eyes of the child is looking like the eyes of a raccoon okay so these are called as raccoon eyes raccoon eyes that are seen in the child and what is what can you see over here this eye looks normal here you can see that the eye has become a little bit smaller correct so this is nothing but horner here it is raccoon eyes huh? this one over here is horner syndrome both of these are seen in case of neuroblastoma and one more sign that sorry you will see in neuroblastoma is diarrhea and why because there is excessive secretion of vasoactive intestinal peptide in case of neuroblastoma okay now one question that they ask you in the exam regarding neuroblastoma what is the specific tumor marker for neuroblastoma anyone specific tumor marker for neuroblastoma okay so specific tumor marker for neuroblastoma is neuron specific enolase okay neuron specific enolase all right now identify the different things first identify this x-ray and then identify the different things that you can see in this x-ray 
just you all mm-hmm. you guys identify i'll come back in 2 seconds i'll just get the charger for the laptop it's running out of battery Yes, very good. This is curvy. Very good, Tina. Okay. So, what are the different things that you guys can see in curvy in this case? Anyone? What are the different things you all can see in curvy? Okay. So, I will mark it for you guys. Hmm. This is the pencil thin cortex. Okay. so cortex is becoming thin so pencil thin cortex then second thing over here you can see there is some swelling so this is nothing but subperiosteal hemorrhage subperiosteal hemorrhage okay then over here at the end see there is this white line okay so this white line is called as white line of frenkel she my handwriting is coming very bad but i hope you guys can understand this and just above this white line over here i'm marking the white line black now you will see a hyperlucent zone so above the white line you will actually see a hyperlucent zone so that hyperlucent zone is called as this hyperlucent zone over here is called as trammel field zone okay trammel fields zone or scorbutic zone okay and of course then you get this ring sign over here so this is called as ring epiphysis and what is the name of this ring epiphysis the name of this is wimberger's ring okay this is caused due to epiphysial bleeding and last but not the least you will see pelkin spurs that are coming out over here okay so pelkin spurs so all of these are seen in scurvy All right. Now identify this X-ray. Chal. Identify this X-ray seen in this child. What are we trying to look at over here? So you can see over here, you have metaphysis that is playing. It is cupping. look over here metaphysis is playing and cupping and fraying okay the bone as you can see over here looks very lucent so there is demineralization of the bone there is bowing of the legs so what are we talking about here yes we are talking about rickets very good this is rickets okay so what are the things you see in rickets you can see the metaphysis is playing cupping then you can see over here there is bowing of the bones and if you see over here the bones look very a uh, blackish in color instead of looking completely white that is because of demineralization of the bones okay now next over here what is this sign called as and what is this organ that you are looking at over here any idea what is the name of the sign and what is this organ that we are looking at over here is it normal or is it abnormal yes very good tavish so this is the thymus okay so this is absolutely normal in children to have the thymus and what is the name of this sign the thymus is seen in like a sail of the boat okay so if you have a boat when we were kids we used to draw boat like this na so this is called as the sail of the boat okay so this is called as sail sign sail sign okay and this is normal in children to see the thymus as we grow up with age the thymus will regress okay so this is called as sail sign theek hai next one now let me give you a little bit of context into this picture this child is born after a very long period of labor so the mother was in labor for about 30 hours and when the child was born he was covered with meconium so what could this be 
and can you see over here he has been there's a rails tube that has been put in from here and even though there is no tube over here i'm telling you that we are now intubating the child so what do you think is happening in the lungs of this child can you see anything okay so i'll tell you guys because we are running a little bit out of time over here so there is overall hyper inflation of the lungs can you see the lungs look little bit of hyper inflated and this is if the child if they give you in the case scenario that there is meconium covered child just close your eyes try to imagine the meconium and answer it as meconium aspiration syndrome okay so there will be what happens in meconium aspiration syndrome is when the child aspirates all that meconium or stool particles then some of his uh, airways okay they get blocked by the meconium so some most of the alveoli will collapse so what will happen to the other alveoli the other alveoli will try to compensatorily hyper inflate so that there can be exchange of oxygen okay so here some alveoli are collapsed you can see in this area most of the alveoli are not seen so on the other hand in the other lung the other lung has undergone compensatory hyperinflation to maintain oxygenation in the child so this is nothing but meconium aspiration syndrome okay and this is our last x-ray for today eight year old has come with fever stiff neck dysphagia and cervical adenopathy so what do you think is there in this anyone in can you identify anything over here see this is the airway this is the trachea that's why you can see it is having this dark shadow over here and there is some swelling which is coming from behind prevertebral calcification hypertrophy swelling kya hai any idea okay एयरवे के पीछे क्या हो सकता है ओके सो देर इज अ रेट्रो फेरेंजल एप्सिस ओवर योर ओके देर इज दिस इज द फेरिंग्स एंड इट इज बीइंग पुश्ड अहेड बाय दिस रेट्रो फेरेंजल एप्सिस सो यू कैन कॉल इट एज अ प्री वॉटेबरल एप्सिस और अ रेट्रो फेरेंजल एप्सिस एनी ऑफ देम सो द चाइल्ड दैट इज वाई इज प्रेजेंटिंग विद डिसफेजिया बिकॉज ऑफ दैट एप्सिस एंड सर्वाइकल अडीनोपैथी बिकॉज ऑफ द इन्फेक्शन सो दिस इज नथिंग बट अ रेट्रो फेरेंजल एप्सिस स्टिफ नेक बिकॉज once these it starts extending behind into the cervical vertebra then even this motion becomes difficult and painful that's why stiff neck okay so fever because of the abscess cervical adenopathy because the, of the inflammatory reaction dysphagia is because of the pressure that the abscess is putting on the pharynx and stiff neck because the abscess is now going behind and extending into the vertebra and it is making the vertebra stiff and painful okay so this is your retro pharyngeal abscess theek okay? hai you can also call it as pre vertebral abscess it's in front of the vertebra and behind the pharynx okay so just quickly showing you guys the x rays that we have discussed this is retro pharyngeal abscess meconium aspiration syndrome sail sign of thymus uh, this is your rickets with metaphyseal uh, splaying cupping fraying bowing of the legs um, then demineralization of the bone this is curvy with all the things that we discussed pencil thin cortex everything okay raccoon eye stosis and this calcification seen in the suprarenal area this is uh, your neuroblastoma okay in the suprarenal area then this is langerhans cell histiocytosis with punched out lesions and burbex granules then we have over here dandy walker malformation with fourth ventricle enlargement and cerebellar vermis agenesis here we have vein of gallen malformation then here we have snowman sign seen in ta pvc here we have egg on a string appearance seen in tga here we have box shaped heart seen in epstein's anomaly then here we have a uh, boot shaped heart seen in tof uh okay your stream was a bit delay yeah i don't know why there is this little delay always in youtube but i'm really sorry about it i don't know maybe we should write to the writers of youtube okay so um 
इट्स ओके नो प्रॉब्लम आई विल स्टिल वेट फॉर द आंसर्स आई एम नो प्रॉब्लम ओके दिस इज एम सी यू शोइंग पोस्टीरियर यूरेट्रल वैल दिस इज रिवर्स थ्री साइन ऑन बेरियम स्वॉलो देन दिस इज योर क्वाकटेशन ऑफ एटा देन यर वी आर सींग स्टीपल साइन सीन एंड क्रूप then here we are seeing thumb signs seen in acute epiglottitis then this over here is different types of pneumonia lobar consolidation and this is atypical pneumonia then uh, here we have congenital lobar emphysema this one over here was cpam congenital pulmonary airway malformation with all the cystic spaces then this was double bubble signs seen in duodenal atresia these were the ultrasound criteria for infantile hypertrophic pyloric stenosis then this was diffuse calcification seen in toxoplasmosis periwinkle particular calcification seen in cmv then uh, this is beaking of the vertebra and bullet shaped metacarpal seen in mucopolysaccharidosis then this is your complete white out of the lung which is seen in respiratory distress of newborn or highline membrane disease this is your air fluid level seen in the uh, uh, abdominal cavity that is seen as a result of necrotizing enterocolitis and last but not the least this was the first x ray that we discuss fluid uh, in the um interlobar fissures or bulging interlobar fissures which is seen in case of what what was the first one bulging interlobar fissures seen in transient tachypnea of newborn okay so i really hope that this was useful for you guys if you liked it please don't forget to leave a thumbs up at the end of it and of course uh, i am actually late for the next class so we have another class now on the latest uh, guidelines of cpr and the questions asked that they can ask on it uh, acls 2020 guidelines so we'll start within 5 minutes i'll just charge a few things and come and um, you will find it on the same channel so if you liked a uh, uh, class please don't forget to leave a thumbs up at the end of it make sure you're there on the telegram group ace neat pg with dr janvi where i will be sharing all the links for my classes okay chal see you. thank you